Today's guest is a perfect match for the Hack My Age podcast. She's a woman going through the menopause transition herself, and she really helps women in this phase of life. And she knows a ton about hormones and managing that unexplained weight gain that some of us get in menopause. My guest today is Karen Martell. She is a certified hormone specialist, a transformational nutritional coach, and authority on women's weight loss. And Karen's also the host of an amazing women's health podcast called The Other Side of Weight Loss, where she unravels the enigmas of female fat loss and hormone imbalances. So you got to check it out and you're going to learn something new, I promise you, and you'll be more in charge of your well-being. Karen also went through her own health challenges, so she really understands what you may be going through, and she's created a revolutionary approach to women's hormone health and weight management. She goes beyond that regular advice of just diet and exercise, and she even disrupts what we think we know about weight loss. Her, her true passion lies in supporting women during that transformative peri and postmenopausal phases, as well as just guiding them to overcome weight management obstacles. So you're going to love this conversation and I know it will help you. So without further ado, let's meet Karen Martell. Welcome. Thank you for having me, Zora. I'm excited to be here. And I love the word transformative. That makes yeah. it just like Yes, right? Because most of us are like, oh, we're going through menopause. And it's almost like shameful and you don't want to admit it. And it's like, uh, transform it. It is, it can be transformative. I love that word. We need to disrupt some of this stereotype. I, I just recently, I think it was about a week ago, I did a post on Facebook with the reels, the women around the world, menopause around the world. I interview women all over the world and I ask them about their menopause experience. And, and this oh, one went viral, like oh. half a million views and people, the comments, uh, it was, there were so many comments and I, it was like over 300 comments and, and I just can't keep up with them, but I could, I was reading them and there's, there's a lot, there's, there's so much debate. There's so much misinformation that women are saying that I see we, you both, you and I have a lot of work to do. And then there was one, some women, because the, the, the person who I was interviewing, she's actually have a generally positive experience. So she, people were comment. Some people said, oh, wow, this is great to finally hear somebody's having a good experience. Some people go, well, I'm not, but you know, at least someone is, or some people say, yeah, me too. I'm actually having a great experience. And then you'd have the haters who were saying, oh, no, 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 no. That's impossible to have that. I'm having 20 hot flashes a day and blah, 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 based on their own personal experience. So it, there's, wow. there's a lot of stuff, yes. <laughs> a lot of baggage yeah. to unpack. <laughs> and I think you and I sometimes live in a bubble where we oh, think, well, yeah, let's high. talk about menopause. I mean, some of my, the women I asked to be interviewed in Poland, for example, recently said, no, no, I would never talk about menopause. And especially in front of a camera, I don't even talk to my friends about it. It's just too personal. And, yeah. to, and so uh, I think, yeah, there's just a lot of work to be done. And and I think you're, yeah. you're helping a lot with that as well. And yes. um, yeah. Isn't I, it shocking those or just how many, like, as you said, we're kind of in this little bubble because we have great followers and we have successful podcasts. I start to think subconsciously, just think, oh, the word's really getting out there. Like women are really being educated in this. <laughs> and then like, I was just on a plane to Florida and I was sitting, I was at the very back of the plane sitting next to two women and we were stuck on the tarmac for an hour. And so of course we all get chatting and this woman's having a hot flash and she's like, oh, here comes the hot flash. And then the other woman's like, oh my gosh, yes. And then they start talking. And so then I'm like, well, actually ladies, I'm a perimenopause and menopause <laughs> specialist. And they're like, what? And they're like, what is happening to us? Like they had no clue. The lady was like, my husband doesn't know who he's waking up to in the morning. I've gained all this weight. I don't know what's happening. I've tried everything for exercise and food. And like, what is the matter with me? And I'm like, how is it that we still, these were like women that were, you know, like they were dressed really nice. They were, high, they were educated. You could, you know, and I'm like, how do they not know? Yeah. How do they not know what their options are? So they don't have to be going through this. They'd been suffering for years and years and years 
with no answers. And it wasn't like they weren't looking for it because they were very open to talking about it. And it just reminded me, I'm like, there's the majority of women still don't know. Yeah. And it's like 70%. I just read this on the menopause society site, which is 70% of women won't go to their doctors, mostly because women are just like, we're, we always have that, like, kind of suck it up, kind of, oh, well, just get through it. You're going to, you know, muscle my way through this and I'm going to do this naturally. And I'm going to, you know, and then if they do go to their doctor, they're getting the same kind of solution, which is, this is normal. Your labs are normal. This is, and it's like, no, they're not. This is, I do not feel normal, (laughs) but the doctor's going, well, I can give you an antidepressant. I can give you birth control pills. I can give you sleeping pills. They rarely say, actually, HRT is a great solution. Most of them will not recommend that, which is just like mind blowing to me. Because yeah. they're not educated. There's no educated. There's like seven, zero to seven percent of doctors are educated in menopause, zero percent in perimenopause. That's depressing. All right. We gotta talk about these solutions. And um, but yeah. but I wanted to ask you about some of the language that we're using. And yeah. and one of them is the word weight loss. And I'm trying to shift away from that because. To me, it's, I, I prefer using the words strength and power, building muscle and all that. And I know that you're so much more than just weight loss. Yes. What do you think this, this word or just using this language, does it have an impact on women's goals and, and how they're, you know, does it affect them at all? I think so. And I, that's the, that was why I named my podcast, the other side of weight loss. It's not about coming to, the, to, to, you know, you've met, you've met your goals, your weight loss goals. And now what's coming, coming on the other side, it is what else is or help, could help us to lose weight. It's not just about calorie in calorie out exercising, but that's what we associate weight loss with still to this day, which I think is really interesting with all of the information that is out there. Women still will resort to I got to work out harder and I got to eat less. And they think that that's going to do it for them. And there's just so much more, especially for women nowadays, because we're in this epidemic of weight loss resistance. So we have a lot of women that are doing the get strong, eating perfectly, and they're still unable to lose weight. So weight loss, it has a very negative association with it. We don't like that word when we think of losing weight or I got to lose weight or weight loss. It's like, oh, it's pain. It's suffering. It's not a good time. We don't look forward to it. It's not easy. So know that it's, it's a, it's a terrible word and it is much better to go, you know what? I'm going to get strong. And I'm just going to feel healthy. And I went through that. Like when I gained a bunch of weight in menopause, in perimenopause, and I was going into menopause at a very early age at 42, I started to go into it. I rapidly gained weight and it was the heaviest I'd ever been. It was depressing. Here I am a weight loss coach. Like what is going on? <laughs> yeah. I thought I was going to sail through menopause <laughs> and it, it just didn't happen like that. And I got to the point where dieting, of course, like the changing of my diet wasn't going to do anything. I replaced the hormones and I just decided, you know what? I am going to just get in shape. I'm going to do exactly what you just said. I'm not going to try to lose weight. I'm going to get strong and the strongest I've ever been. So I did, I did exactly that. And I started lifting heavy and I just focused on that. But I will be honest with you, Zora, still in the back of my head. And I think this happens for every woman. I still, of course, hoped and prayed it was going to make me lose weight. Yeah. And that's, it's, that's depressing, but it's a reality that the majority of women out there, if they have gained weight, they are going to hope that they will lose weight by getting strong and healthy. And it's usually not enough for us to just get strong. And I did get so much more strong, but a lot of it, I couldn't see the muscle. <laughs> and, and then I definitely did. I started to lose some of the fat and I started to see more muscle, but it wasn't until I went back down to my original weight and a little bit less. And we can talk about how I did that, but then that, that I started to really see that muscle growth. And that was very satisfying, but 
yes, I agree that we need to change that focus and really say, let's just get, let's focus on getting in shape and then see what happens. Thank you so much for your honesty, because it's so much easier said than done. Let's just focus on building muscle and getting (laughs) strong. But the reality is, like you said, is you just yeah want to lose the weight and yeah. and you hope that and I just I don't know uh, how to change that mentality I don't know if it's a matter of let's just accept our body as it is it's it's going to be strong and I love it and or, or just you know I don't know I really don't know to be honest how to change that mentality I I know because it's society. I mean, everywhere a woman turns and looks, it's, it's not acceptable to put on 15 pounds, you know, suddenly it's not okay. And then, so we're trying our best to get rid of it and get back down to this like physique that we once had. And that's not unfortunately realistic for very many women. And we have to accept that our bodies do change shape as we age. And it is normal to soften a little bit. And I think that we really have to start wrapping our heads around that. I really focused on that for years, which was, I'm going to accept my body the way it is. I was in the best shape of my life. I felt great. I was, I was a little bit curvier, but I really actually liked my body. And I was like, okay, this is okay. This is like heavier than I've ever been, but I actually don't mind myself in a bikini. I look good. I'm going to embrace this. And I'm just going to keep working at getting in shape. And, and I, really worked at that. And it was, I wish more women would do that. It's like, go, okay, I have to, I have to embrace a little bit of weight gain in, in menopause. Yeah. It's very normal. What are your thoughts then? Uh, I'm, I'm wondering there's that, there is this body acceptance that's happening. I see in the U S it's not quite here in Europe or anywhere else um, where you have mannequins that are you know bigger and show what clothes look like. And I think that's really cool. I'm just wondering if, you know, there this comes a point where being having excess weight, you know, not not being thin, I'm not, not being thin or, or lean or anything. I'm just saying there's a healthy body weight. And then you go past that. And that is being metabolic, metab- metabolically unhealthy. And that sets you up for risk of disease. And, and maybe you don't feel so great. That to me uh, is, uh, where is that fine line? What, mm-hmm. what do you think yeah. about that? Yeah, because I've seen on social media, there was a model, I can't remember, it was like two years ago where they put her, maybe it was like Swimsuit Magazine or something, Sports Illustrated, a, a very curvaceous woman on in, in a bikini. And, and 100%, it wasn't healthy curvaceous. She was mm-hmm. definitely, her, her body weight, her, uh, you know, her BMI was definitely in the, about that picture and i've seen it on other things as well where it's being you know we're, we're, so there's this group of people that are like we need to embrace that we need to support this and be like and be okay and self-acceptance and you know we need to be okay with curves and being overweight and being and accepting of that but then there's the flip side of you know people like ourselves who are very into health and nutrition and living long and you know feeling great in our bodies and that's includes metabolic health And so should we be glorifying that and accepting it and saying, you're okay to be that way? Like there, it's a really, like you said, fine line, because I want these women to feel good about themselves. I don't want to do body, have body shaming. And I don't, you know, I want them to be like, you know what? That's amazing. But then on the flip side, it's like, but are you healthy? You know, do you feel good? Are you inflamed? You know, do you have metabolic disease? And then it's like, so maybe that's not okay. It's a really hard thing. What do you think? <laughs> I, it's it's a fine line, and it's a question yes. that that yeah. needs to be posed. And and at the same time, is it my business? Should I be concerned? Yes. Is it? Yeah. Are they happy? Like, I just want people to be happy. Like, if they're happy, great. If we can make them happier, great. But then there's, you know, when I was doing my gerontology degree, and I, we were talking about healthcare and uh, social security and all this stuff. And so, you know, the healthcare system is really being uh, <laughs> squeezed in the U.S. Just probably like it is in Canada where you're at. 
and and you and we talked about health insurance and how how some people they're I forgot the word right it's like it's sort of risk takers and they have risky health behaviors right they don't really care and they're just whatever they they're the ones who buy the expensive insurance because they know you know they can do whatever and then you have these sort of quote unquote healthy people who go I don't know I'll never use those medicines because I'm I'm taking care of my health so then those people kind of drop out and don't buy into the insurance and then the whole insurance bubble gets uh, distorted because of some people using too much uh, and the other people not buying into it. And so, so my, my question sometimes is, 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 well, okay, do, is my health insurance going to be affected because of those people? Cause then it'll affect me. If it doesn't affect me, I don't care. It's your life. You do what you want. And, and I think that's a lot of people are just human beings are hardwired like that. I don't care that if it affects them, then it's a problem. So mm-hmm. that's just another question we have to, to pose about, um, being healthy. Right. And, uh, there's plenty of people who are not healthy and they're happy. Well, okay, great. You know, but yeah but be a problem for society later on I don't know yeah and it's I just think that when it comes to being obese and being heavily overweight it's a disease and so to point our finger at people and say you know you're burdening the system because you're not taking care of your body and your health but on the flip side of that is this is we are being bombarded everywhere we go by highly palatable, horrible, what, you, what we can't even call food. Food like substances is what I yes, say. Yes. <laughs> it's like saying, it's like if we had to, you know, if everybody had to use heroin and yeah. we all just had to have just a little bit to survive, but heroin, heroin was everywhere. Everywhere you looked, it was there. It was in restaurants. It was in grocery stores. Like it was like, take your pick of heroin, you know, and it's the most, one of the most addictive things. Well, so is sugar. They say sugar is more addictive than cocaine is. Oh yeah. yeah, We have to, we have to eat, right? We don't have to do the cocaine, but we have to eat. And this is everywhere you turn and go, it's like, eat, 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 eat this terrible chemical, chemical laden food. And then we're turning and pointing our finger and saying, why don't you have more willpower? Yeah. I just saw this horrible thread on a carnivore Instagram site, very popular one. And the, the, how mean people were being, it was about Ozempic and Ozempic is a weight loss peptide just in case. Yeah. Yeah. And we'll talk about that, but the, what people were saying, I wish I could have reached through my phone and slapped them. <laughs> I was just like, you assholes, how dare you say it's just about willpower, eat better. Eat, uh. you, these people, they're taking the easy way out. And I'm like, you've obviously never dealt with severe addiction before, or even a little bit of addiction, which they probably have. And they're still judging everyone. Everybody is addicted to things, whether it be food or sex or social media, they're probably all addicted to social media as they're sitting there on their Instagram. (laughs) So who are you to judge? Like, it just blows my mind that you don't know what these people are going through and how hard it is for them that there could, that here we have a, a very safe drug that is helping people to lose weight and to change their eating habits. This is mm. amazing. This is like a miracle. And and you're going to diss this and diss the people that are going to do it? How dare you? That's what I think. I just-, I, I just I, I, Yeah, I want to talk about this, uh, it, but we're I'm going to pin put a pin in it and we're going to come back to it because I want to talk first about the- the fact that that many women, not all of them, struggle with the changes in their body composition, like belly fat or losing their muscle tone when they enter menopause yep. or perimenopause. Okay, and that's a whole of can of worms that many guys don't even know about. I many women don't know about either. But even when some of these women have changed their diet and exercise, like you said, oh, let's just you know eat less and Double exercise down. more, <laughs> yeah. it doesn't work, and it's so frustrating because some some women do this and and nothing budges, and sometimes it even gets worse when they do that. So yeah. tell us what is happening to these women in this peri and post menopause um, period. Like why why is this happening to them? Yeah, and not everybody. I mean, like why some and why not others? You know. Yes. Well, in majority, I mean, 85% of women will have symptoms of perimenopause and menopause. And I would say a large percentage of that will gain weight. I mean, I've come across the woman that, you know, was 115 pounds her entire life. 
And then she hits menopause and she puts on 20 pounds and she's just horrified. Like, how could this possibly happen to my body? And so we do, this is, this is very prevalent, the weight gain in menopause. So most women will gain some weight anywhere from five to all the way to 30 pounds. I've had some women gain 50 pounds and it typically- In a short period of time as well. Very short period of time. Yep. And this is, we see a little bit of weight gain happening in the perimenopausal early days. So late thirties, early forties, we'll see like a five pound weight gain kind of come out of nowhere for women. And this is because of the drop of progesterone. Progesterone um, will actually raise your metabolism. So if you've ever done fertility treatments, any, any of you listening, you know, you had to take your basal body temperature and on day 14, your body temperature goes up, you know, you've ovulated and then it stays elevated until your period. So elevation of that is an elevation in your metabolic rate. And so when we don't ovulate, we don't produce progesterone. So as we start to lose our eggs and they get less and less, and we're not ovulating as often, our metabolism isn't going up for that second half of the cycle. Not good. So that's where that little bit of weight gain happens, typically happens all over, not in one spot. Without that progesterone, our thyroid doesn't doesn't function as well. Uh, Thyroid function really depends on progesterone. So without that, now the thyroid's kind of coming down a little bit for some women, and that will drop your metabolic rate as well. So that's the cause of the early phase of a little bit of weight gain for some women. As we start to head into our late 40s and sometimes early 50s, now estrogen drops and estrogen typically kind of goes on this roller coaster of a ride in our late 40s early 50s until it finally plateaus when we're typical age of menopause is 52. so when this happens that is where we see the majority of the weight gain and this because this can happen quite quickly it can kind of fall right off the cliff estrogen for some women and so suddenly they're going like their weight just goes right up. And that can be that 20 pounds in a year. I can't tell you how many times I've heard that from women, like 20 pounds in a year and their periods are getting missed and they're getting lighter periods and they're getting the hot flashes. This is because estrogen is needed for insulin sensitivity. It is also extremely important for putting the glucose into our muscles and helping us build muscle tissue. It's called the glute. There's a glute. It's a, glute it helps four? with the glute four transporter. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> you probably know more about that one than I do. <laughs> no, but it's important to mention. Yeah. It, I, I yeah, keep, keep learning. And I mean, the first time I heard about it was from Dr. Stacy Sims on the menopause for athletes program. And yeah, I just stuck after that. So that, that is important. Yeah. Very important. Yeah, we typically think testosterone is the one that helps us with keeping our muscle tissue, which it does very much so help with that. But estrogen, they say, is could be even more important for keeping muscle tissue. So now we're losing muscle tissue, which we know is responsible for over 70% of glucose metabolism in the body. So now we're getting more metabolically unhealthy because of that loss of estrogen. Plus estrogen helps us to just be insulin sensitive, like I said. It helps with the production of serotonin, which is an antidepressant neurotransmitter. So what do, do we want to eat broccoli and <laughs> healthy chicken when we are depressed? No, we don't. What are we going to reach for? We're going to reach for carbohydrates. Carbohydrates help us to then produce tryptophan, which then helps us to produce serotonin. So your body starts to call out for more carbs. Estrogen is also very important for both ghrelin and leptin sensitivity, our hunger hormone. So without estrogen, we get hungry we can't get full. And you'll hear this from women. They'll be like, I I can't stop eating. I don't know what's wrong with me. I'm trying so hard to control my diet. I can't, you know, I'm usually not into eating sugar. I definitely know I was never a sugar person. And then as I was losing my estrogen, I was like every day going, Oh, where's that little something sweet that I need. And I was like, Oh, what's happening here. And sure enough, I watched my blood sugar. We were just talking about this before we started on air. I watched my blood sugar go up. And that was devastating. I was like, no, I've had perfect blood sugar my whole life. And it just went up. 
And it was the loss of this estrogen driving my food behavior, and then also just making me more insulin resistant. And you will see this across the board on women's labs. They'll just say, I've always had great cholesterol, great blood sugar. And then they start to go into menopause, their cholesterol's flagged, their blood sugar's flagged, or it's gone up. And they're going, what? I haven't done anything. I haven't changed my diet. I'm still exercising. Why is it doing this? And it's like, this is from the loss of those hormones, vital hormones, specifically estrogen. Progesterone has something to do with it as well, but estrogen is really the big driver of this bus, this metabolic bus. And if we start to lose this estrogen, what do we do? We go to, you know, some of us will go to our doctor because we're getting these symptoms, right? We maybe we're getting hot flashes, depression. Now we can't sleep because we're waking up in night sweats. You go to your doctor. The doctor says, oh, well, you do still have a period. And if you still have your period, you will never be given estrogen. Even in hormone clinics, so many of them refuse to give you estrogen, specifically even estradiol. Which is, the, which is what's driving all of this. They'll give you bias, which is mostly estriol, which can actually make insulin resistance worse. So you go to your doctor and they won't give you anything for this. They won't give you any, they'll say, exercise more and eat less is what you're going to get if you're gaining weight. If we could catch this, Sora, in perimenopause and we can say, oh, look, you're getting all of the symptoms of estrogen loss. Let's just give you a little smidge of estradiol just to just top things up a little bit while you go through this transformative time <laughs> into menopause. I tell you what, we would not see at least 80% of these problems that we're seeing right now. It's that women, they, they're being told they can't have estrogen until they're in menopause, which is the craziest thing because what? We can have loads of estradiol through our entire fertile years from the time we're 13 to the time we're 45, we can have boatloads of estrogen and nobody's saying that it's a danger. And then suddenly in menopause, we have to wait till we have none before they're going to give it back to our body, that's like telling the diabetic, well, until you have no insulin, then we'll give you insulin. Or the thyroid patient, we're not going to give you thyroid medication until you have at the bottom of the barrel, until you're a hot mess and 50 pounds overweight. It makes no sense. But we, because of that stupid doubt women's health initiative study, there's still so much misinformation about estrogen replacement therapy. And so people are afraid of it. Women are afraid of it. Doctors are afraid of it. But the information is out there. The research is out there. You just got to go and find it or listen to people like you and I that talk about it. And we know that estradiol prevents the three largest diseases for women, like killers of women. We've got, it helps with dementia, Alzheimer's, cancer, heart disease, osteoporosis. These are all driven by estrogen deficiency. And so if we can just top up that estradiol as we go through this stage, we wouldn't get nearly as overweight as we are getting. And then we wouldn't have to try to reverse this, which that's where it gets really hard. And so some women, they can be in menopause and they finally get some estrogen into their system. Now they're 20 pounds overweight and for a lot of women, replacing and giving back that estrogen can help them to feel better and help their blood markers and help oh, so many things, but they still don't lose weight. Some women do. It's like a 50-50 where they'll start the, the replacement and it's like, boom, they'll lose all their weight and it's like, great, everything's happy, happy. And then you get this other subset of women that they'll, they're eating right, they're exercising, they're replacing their hormones, and they still can't get the weight off that they gained. And that's where we have to kind of go, okay, what other interventions can we do here? Yeah. And you give a choice, which I want people to really follow you because you do give so much more advice and that people would actually hear. But one thing that stood out for me that you mentioned before, and I've had other podcasts with other doctors and and, and experts, and when you say that all our lives are through, you know, from, from birth until perimenopause, we've had loads of estrogen and that's okay. And the moment we start losing it, 
uh, we have, we, we're not given what we need. And in fact, what I've been hearing from, from it's very much like this, this post that I made is, oh, estrogen causes cancer. Well, if estrogen caused cancer, then we'd all be getting cancer when we're teenagers and in our twenties and thirties. So exactly. again, that doesn't even make any sense. So we have to clear that, you know, I think what, what do you know about estrogen or hormone therapy and cancer? Yes. So in the WHI study, <clears throat> there was two arms of the study. There was an arm of the study where women did not have a uterus. And in that arm of the study, they only gave them Premarin, which was the old HRT. I'm sure you've talked about this on your podcast before. It was horses estrogen came from their urine, pregnant horses urine. And the other arm of the study did both progestin, which was a fake progesterone, and the Premarin. When they reanalyzed this study, because this is the study was stopped because there was an increase in breast cancer, an increase of one extra person out of every thousand. So not very much. And, and on top of increase... it, wasn't it, wasn't it, they gave it to women in their 60, the average age was 60 yes, or something. 60 and 65. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> because okay. they couldn't find women that weren't on it. Premarin mm. was the number one most prescribed drug in, in North America for mm. a very long time, number one. So to try and find a menopausal woman not on it was very challenging. So they found women in their late, in their between 60 and 65 was the average age range. A lot of them were unhealthy. A lot of them were smokers and drinkers. Either way, when they looked at this study, they actually found that it was in the progestin arm of the study that had the increased risk of breast cancer in the arm of the study that the, the women were only using Premarin, they had a 30% reduction in breast cancer. Oh, wow. Well. They didn't mention that. <laughs> they don't, No, they did not. And yet still, this is what we all have in our head is estrogen causes breast cancer. So when we go into menopause, and this is why we see breast cancer so prevalent in menopausal women, which is another interesting fact. When is When do we get breast cancer usually? when we don't have estradiol. So es there's three estrogen. We've got estrone, estradiol, and estriol. Estriol, we produce a boatload of it when we're pregnant, and that's the only time that we produce a boatload of it. And it comes, we make it through the placenta. Then there's the estrone, which is a, a more inflammatory of the estrogens. And we produce this out of our fat cells and estrone can aromatize down into estradiol and then back and forth. And then they, those two will go down into estriol and give your body a little bit of estriol through your fertile years. Really great for vagina lubrication, estriol. And I do think that our bodies are really smart and we start to lose ovarian function in menopause. So we're now not producing estradiol anymore in our ovaries. Our body is like, oh, we need estradiol. So where can we get it? We can get it through estrone, which is made through fat cells. So I do think that there's this like backup mechanism and I have no proof of this. This is just my theory is your body puts fat on in menopause just to get some, some more estrogen. So estrone is produced and then we can move down into estradiol. Same with, we can make it out of the adrenal system too, a little bit. So in menopausal women, we tend to produce more estrone and, and less than, or no estradiol out of the ovaries anymore. Estrone goes up and estrone's inflammatory and it only acts on what's called the alpha receptors, the estrogen, the E, the, e, the alpha, the estradiol alpha receptor. That is more proliferative. There's alpha, there's beta. Alpha is exactly what it sounds like. It's like the, it's like this tough guy. It's great. Great for bone health, right? We want, we, we want prolifer proliferation in bones and other things, but if you have breast cancer cells, estrone being more proliferative and more inflammatory can make those breast, those cancer cells proliferate. Sounds like growth does, hormone. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So it doesn't, estradiol, it acts on both alpha and beta to a 50-50 ratio. 
And it's very important. It acts as an anti-inflammatory estradiol. So now we don't have this nice buffer, this anti-inflammatory buffer of estradiol, and we have too much estrone causing more inflammation and just proliferation. And so this is where this can be a problem if you have estrogen receptor breast cancer. And so it doesn't cause, we know this now, you can look at all the research. We know estrogen does not cause breast cancer, but it can make it worse. They used to treat women back in like the 1950s with high doses of estradiol to treat breast cancer. Wow. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. And there's um, a Dr. Avram Blooming. He wrote estrogen Med changing the thoughts on this. Hold on. Yeah. You just got cut off. So yeah. Uh, Avram Blooming, he wrote estrogen matters. I love that book. And then what did you say after that? He's really, he's an oncologist and he's been treating women post breast he's seen less reoccurrence of okay. them getting their breast cancer back, which is like amazing. Yeah. So if you, if you want more information, I would highly recommend reading his book because he cites a lot of different studies and he talks a lot about the benefits of estradiol and how important it is uh, for breast health. Interesting. Definitely. I love that book. It's something I always recommend people to get started with, to understand, uh, what will, what it, just their hormones, just a little bit more about hormone therapy. I wanted to ask you then a question about estrogen dominance. So you, what you're saying was like all, most women who are gaining weight, perhaps at least with 50% of them, they have, um, they're, even though they replenish their estrogen, they're still not having any, any positive effects, but in terms of the weight body composition. So what about those people who are estrogen dominant? Do, is that safe for them to take more estrogen? So estrogen dominance is a very misunderstood term because in our fertile years, we can be estrogen dominant in the sense of we have lots of estrogen, estradiol and estrone. And you'll see this on, on lab. Like I do a lot of hormone testing and I'll see women where their estrogen is off the charts high. And it's like, okay, this person is truly estrogen dominant. I will tell you, I've done thousands of hormone tests at this point. I have come across a handful of women that were truly had too much estrogen. Like there, it, it's not a lot. And every woman thinks she has it. And what it comes down to is typically what starts to happen is we start to lose the progesterone in our early forties. Cause remember, like I said, when, once we stop ovulating, we lose progesterone. So estrogen dominance is typically that at, there's just, there's sometimes usually enough estrogen and then healthy levels of estrogen, but there's not enough progesterone to counterbalance that estrogen. So then we start getting symptoms of estrogen dominance, the weight gain, the inflammation, heavy periods, cramping, breast tenderness. And then so women are like, oh my gosh. And every woman in her forties is told to hop on a product called d indole methane. And this is handed out like candy in uh, pellet centers, the uh, testosterone pellet centers. Every single woman is put on DIM. Doesn't matter what her age is, what her estrogen status is, she's put on D indole methane. Well, D indole methane lowers your estrogen. So if you have a woman that's in her 40, like mid 40s to late 40s, who's losing her estrogen, but yet she's having symptoms of estrogen dominance, and she starts taking DIM, she's going to lower her estrogen faster, which is then going to cause more waking and more problems down the road. Plus there's two phases to estrogen detoxification. So if we don't know what that woman's phases are doing and you just give her dim, well, she may not have a problem with that phase of detoxification with her estrogen. Her problem may be in phase two, which is called methylation. So if your problem is in with methylation, 
and you're not metabolizing your estrogen very well through that phase two, and you start taking this dim, you can have a lot of problems and women can start to feel really sick because they're not getting rid of this estrogen that's being poured out thanks to this dim, and then they're not methylating it out. So it's, it's, it's not something that should be willy nilly. And it is always like women are constantly given dim. I have, um, hundreds of blog posts on my website. The most frequent and frequented blog post is one on estrogen dominance. So every woman, because she can relate to the symptoms, it's like, oh yeah, check, check, check. I'm gaining weight in my hips. My boobs are sore. I'm bleeding heavy. Oh, I have too much estrogen. And typically it's just that you need to top up with some progesterone and support your phase one, phase two, like figure out which ones are having problems, support those with supplementation minus the dim for a lot of cases, unless it's truly too high. Don't be taken dim because you're going to lower your estrogen even faster and start running into those, all those problems we talked about earlier, a lot faster. Oh my gosh. Wow. This is yeah information. I think a lot of, some people don't know what dim is, but at least now, you know, and those who are, do know it probably taking it. So take mm-hmm. this bit of advice is just make sure you check your hormones to see then if you are methylating or not methylating, which you know, we, we can talk about this because a traditional doctor will not know this information, barely knows what to do with a menopausal woman. What do you do in terms of trying to find out if you truly are an estrogen dominant and where your progesterone and your estrogen levels are? Yeah, because most, so if you go to a doctor, even to a hormone clinic, most of the time they're going to test you via blood. And if you look at the range of estradiol, (laughs) it's going to say that you are in range if you are anywhere from 20 to up here in Canada, all the way up to like 800, a thousand down there in the United States, you guys have different measurements, but it'll go up to, let's say 300. So if you're from like 10 to 300, you're good. Like the range is ridiculously large. And I will tell you, some women can lose a little tiny bit of that estrogen. So it looks like on their blood work, they've got plenty. I was one of these people. If someone looked at my blood work, they're like, oh, you have great estrogen levels. It's right smack in the middle. But yet I'm missing my periods. I'm hot flashing. I'm gaining weight. I have all the symptoms of estrogen deficiency. But I love, my body loves estrogen. So even lowering it just a little bit, cause a lot of problems for me. Rather other women, they can drop way down on their estrogen and not feel a thing. But yet some women, if they lose their testosterone, that's when they get all the symptoms. For me, I, my testosterone went way down. I didn't, I didn't notice at all. And I now I top it up, but some of us are genetically more androgenic. Some are more estrogenic. So to go to your doctor and just get blood work done, A, they'll just take it randomly. If you're still cycling, you need to take it on specific days because our hormones fluctuate so much throughout the month. If you're menopausal and you go get checked, the doctor's going to go, yeah, you're in range, in range for a menopausal woman, which is less than 20. I think it is. That's not okay, but they'll say that it's okay. Blood work is only going to test what's called bound hormone levels. And so it's bound to a protein. You can think of it as a bus that shuttles your hormones around, but it has to get off that bus to become available to dock onto the receptor and send its message into the cell. And so blood testing is only going to test what's bound up. We want to see what free levels do you have, which is tiny, tiny amounts, what's actually available for us to use. And there's a lot of things that can affect that protein, which is the bus. So it's called sex hormone binding globulin. Well, thyroid medication can raise it. And the higher it is, the more it's going to bind up your hormones, which is also what happened to me from taking thyroid medication. Nobody told me that. Mm -hmm. Um, Low carb fasting too much, which hello, everybody's doing that right now, that can raise SHBG, which makes total sense because you're telling your body, there's not a lot of food around. We're in a famine. I've been fasting, intermittent fasting or OMAD 
for the last two years, well, your body's going to think on the inside. It's not going to say, oh, she's just doing what's trendy. She's doing OMAD. She's doing intermittent fasting. <laughs> OMAD no, is one body, meal a day for those who don't know. One meal it is. a day. Yeah. Very popular. Your body's going to go, this is not the time to get pregnant. Let's raise this protein, which will bind up all our fertility hormones so that we can't pr get pregnant. And you'll see this. I'll have women come to me. I've been keto for two years, three years, whatever. And I lost my period. And these are women that are in their thirties, oh. you know, or women that are like, oh, I felt so good in the beginning. It was so amazing. And then a year later, I suddenly started gaining all this weight and feeling like crap and losing my hair and what's happened. And it's like, cause your body is binding up all of these vital hormones and saying, we can't get pregnant lower the available hormone levels. So we have to be, yeah. So things like urine testing is what is what I prefer to do is it's going to test how you metabolize your estrogens. So we're going to see how are you doing with phase one? How are you doing with phase two? What is your cortisol levels? What's your metabolized cortisol levels? It tells you all of this, it tells you what free available levels you have of these hormones. And so it gives us a much bigger picture than just blood work. If possible, I always have women do both. I like doing blood work and I like doing urine work to compare the two and to use both of them. So ideally that's what we want to see. Unfortunately, urine is a private test. And so it definitely costs more for the, for the average patient. So Are all the there is that, tests, if you have yeah. to, we do blood. We and talk we about symptoms. We talk about the Dutch test a lot and uh, in our Facebook group as well. We just posted a very interesting uh, discussion about this. And the problem is it is it is very expensive. The Dutch test, the dried urine test of comprehensive hormones is the one that most of us are using. But there are others out there. Are there any competitors that are more reasonably priced? There is. ZRT does one and I did run that test for a while. Uh, it gave... Interestingly, it gave more markers, but I didn't find that it was as accurate hmm. because I would have, you know, if there was some, there, some women, you know, what I'd always get their blood work done, for instance, with it. And it was really off with the levels. Like one would say one thing, like the person was, let's say estrogen, like excess estrogen. And then the other one would say that they had no estrogen with their blood work. So it was like, how is that possible? And so I just, there was too many issues and I just thought, I don't think that this is the, the best test to do. Um, I found that Dutch, the way they presented the information was a lot better uh, and it seemed to be far more accurate. So it was, it was too bad because I was running that one for a long time because I was like, oh, this is so much cheaper for people, gives us all the same markers plus some, awesome. But there was too many that just, and, and once I saw a couple of them, that just made me go, Ooh, I don't know. <laughs> mm -hmm. So I, besides that, there is another, like a 24 hour urine, um, test that I just came across through Dr. David Rosensweet. So he does metabolite testing and he's been doing a lot of work around what, what test is best basically. And so this is a little bit different than what the Dutch test is, but it was still in that price range. Yeah, in that, like four to five hundred price range, four to five hundred U.S. dollars, and that's yeah. that's on top of that. You need to pay somebody who's able to read this. It's not you can't just take it to your normal doctor. Most doctors are are not trained to interpret it, and so that's yeah. probably and it doesn't I, have to I be a do doctor. Include that with yeah. mine. Yeah, yeah, it could be yeah hormone specialist like you can interpret that. It doesn't have to be a doctor. So, but it's still yeah. Oh, you would you include that in the Dutch test? Or, I, don't I do. Like, so if somebody purchases the Dutch test from my website, which is the same price as what a Dutch like the Dutch company sells it for, so it's not. I don't mark it up. Mm -hmm. um, I include a video interpretation of me going through their results plus a written interpretation of it. Oh, recommendation. Wow. Okay. We're including yeah. your <laughs> links to you in the show notes. So go and grab that because that's huge. You know, normally mm -hmm. I pay about $200 to get somebody to interpret it at least. So um, thank you for sharing that. I, I want to go back to something you said that um, confused me a little bit. You mentioned that your own experience, for example, with 
losing the estrogen and that drove you to have certain behaviors. You never liked sugar before and suddenly you like sugar. So you're eating more. And so then of course your, your insulin level goes up now. Uh, is, so is the insulin being driven because of your eating behaviors or is it because it, originally it's because you lost the estrogen and that's maybe the root cause. But if for some people, are there people who don't have the sugar craving or do, literally have not changed their diet at all, still lost the estrogen and are still having insulin um, uh, all, all the time, okay. almost across the board. Yep. So it can be both. Yes. Yep. Mm -hmm. Got it. Okay. Let's move on. <laughs> so many other questions. Um, so little time. So we called this episode, or at least I called it the best menopause diet. And of course it's so much more than that, but what do you think women in peri and postmenopause should be doing with their nutrition? And, and is it the same for peri and postmenopause? Is it the same for all women? What do you think we should be doing nutrition wise? And not only foods we yeah. eat, maybe timing or whatever, whatever you got. So there's definitely like, I'm a person that over my many years experience, like 20 plus years of experience being into nutrition and being a nutritionist and helping women with weight loss. I, and going through all the fats myself and with clients, like I got on the keto train, I got on the fasting train, I got on the carnivore train. I got, I've been on every train there is. And I came, once I started to understand hormones more, I realized we really have to tailor our diet towards what our hormones are doing at that time and then be willing to change that once we've kind of figured, once we've maybe healed that hormonal imbalance. So in our fertile years, you know, if you've got PCOS, polycystic ovarian syndrome, you likely have insulin resistance as well. So going keto carnivore is amazing for that. But if you're somebody that's got hypothyroidism, that's not being treated properly, which is millions of women, and you've got an adrenal insufficiency, going keto or carnivore is going to tank you and make you probably put more fat on. Fasting so included. Really, yeah. Fasting included. Uh, yes. And so we have to tailor what we're doing to where we are at hormonally. Now, when it comes to menopausal women, there's definitely some things that I have seen working with as many women as I have with their diets that I have seen definitely work for the masses. That is an ancestral diet. So preferably paleo, if you don't have major insulin resistance, I, I really like paleo over keto because I do not believe that keto is our natural state. It was a backup mechanism in times of famine that we, that that's why the body created it. So I think that for a normal, like if you've, you know, you don't have any of this severe metabolic syndrome going paleo is taking out a lot of those inflammatory foods in we become more inflamed in menopause because we lose that estradiol. So eating an anti-inflammatory diet like paleo or some version of that, I definitely have seen that work the best out of all the diets. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and if you can prioritize protein, and I know you've probably talked about all this a lot, but remember losing estrogen, we lose our muscle tissue. We need to maintain our muscles. We know that protein is super important that your body will actually seek it out. I don't know if you, have you ever read the book, um, eat like the animals? No, that's the one oh I haven't read yet. <laughs> so many have the guys on your podcast. Really? They're, they were amazing. They're from Australia, these two researchers, and they have been researching the human diet and animal diets for ever. And what they found in their research, which was really good research, was that we will seek out food and be hungry. Like we're going to have be driven by our hunger signals. If we're not getting enough protein, you will overeat carbohydrates till you, you meet your protein threshold in your system. And so we will constantly overeat foods that we're not supposed to be eating to try to meet our protein needs. 
And so we have to, and in menopause, it changes. And he talks about this. They just didn't, they just published a paper about this two years ago. About oh, and then I have to have them on. They women. talk about menopause and that's very interesting. And the importance of protein and how yeah. we have got to prior, it becomes the most important it, through our whole lives. It's the most important thing and that we will seek it out. And it's one of the reasons why so many human beings overeat is because wow. they're eating carbohydrates and their body will overeat those carbs because there's so little protein in them trying to meet the protein, uh, minimal amount of protein that we need. And they're not saying to overdo the protein, quite the opposite. It's like this fine line of it's not carnivore. We shouldn't be doing carnivore. It's more that we just need to meet this protein intake first and foremost, so that then we don't eat as much of the other stuff. Yeah. So it's what's what I see is a great book. We're eating the, 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 the very high, high refined carbohydrates. And then on top of that, we're eating the protein and, <laughs> and everything else and all the sugars. And so I think that is a very interesting. And I bet that number changes person to person in terms of your protein needs. If you're a 65 year old woman, or if you're a 20 year old guy, you probably have different protein needs. If you're sedentary, if you're active. So if interesting, I wonder that if they could say that your body, you dial in, if you could intuitively eat and understand and try to listen to those signals and interpret them correctly, yes. then you would find the optimal amount of protein for you so that you are satiated and then you can move on to your carbs or whatever it is that you like, right? Yeah. And they saw this in the animal kingdom. And that's what's so fascinating. Like they start with the chimpanzee where they would just give them the chimpanzee all this fruit and random stuff. And then they would measure all the nutrient intake. That chimpanzee would eat the exact amount of protein all the time. So it would select its foods to meet a, a, a very exact protein intake. It, mm. It's it's phenomenal. And then they saw it in like, crickets and the, uh, they they went through so many different animals and then they did human studies to see what humans would do and they could only do it was very hard to ma manage that study but they did do it and they did see that human beings would also do the same thing so they're lovely men i loved them talking to them and they have a, a really fascinating story like they travel into these remote areas of the world and so you'll you'll appreciate it zora but yeah Ooh. read the book and, and have them on <laughs> did you you do have you have a podcast with them yeah okay send me the link and i'll I will. put that in the show notes as well people can just go listen right away i don't have to wait yeah, for me yeah yeah <laughs> So, yeah, so protein being very important, and I and I drive this into all my women's heads, which is prioritize protein. If you have to in menopause, it is the most important macronutrient at, during this time so that we can preserve our muscle tissue. And I see it being the most impactful when it comes to losing weight is prioritizing protein because you'll tend to eat less. It's the most thermogenic. It's very satisfactory to eat protein, like within a meal, right? You get very satiated from it. Um, it builds muscle. And sometimes all, that's all I'll tell a woman, like don't follow any specific diet. J I just want you to meet your protein intake throughout the day mm. and see what happens. And it's amazing what happens. They're like, oh my gosh, my sugar cravings went down. I've lost weight. I feel so much better. I don't eat, eat as much. I don't, you know, sometimes that's all they have to do. So, and then with what's going on hormonally for you, you can adjust this. So look at what your cortisol is doing, your adrenal system, look at your thyroid status, look at your insulin, look at your blood sugar, and then tailor that low inflammatory diet to what's happening to you hormonally. So if you've got adrenal insufficiency, if you've got low thyroid function, optimize those things first and foremost, and then also apply the right diet to that, which will be a diet that's higher in carbohydrates. You're going to have, you know, you're, gonna, you're not going to be super low carb. You're not going to be fasting all the time. You're going to be building the system, giving your body nutrients. Rather, if you are in this excess and you're quite overweight, you've got insulin resistance, 
you know, you've got, you know, maybe not the best cholesterol levels, things like that. Well, you're going to want to lean more towards a lower carb diet or a cyclical carbohydrate diet. Um, I do a lot of that in my groups, which is I cycle the carbs in and out to kind of give people that happy medium where they can adjust it to their needs. So if they're more metabolically diseased, then they're going to lean on the side of doing more low carb days than the higher carb days, if they're on the other end of that spectrum and they're more deficient and they've got adrenal insufficiency and thyroid problems, they're going to do more carb cycling days than they are the low carb days. And they're not going to be doing the intermittent fasting. So there's one couple of questions. One will be about, I have a question. Don't remind me because this is the second question is about metabolic, uh, ins- metabolic um, syndrome. And the, the first question I want to ask you, because it just kind of rides off the back of something you just said, uh, was um, to add on to what you said about protein uh, requirements, just get that going. Like that's a, what you, to me, stood out yeah. clearly as like the number one thing to do, just get enough protein. And I, I, I sing the same mantra. And what I tell some of my clients to, to do, which helps them, if some of them are like, I don't know, how much do I need and how do I weigh and how do I measure? I just tell them, try to get protein at every meal. Okay. Yes. Just get it at every, it, you know, breakfast, lunch, and dinner, or, you know, if you're eating two meals, like just get, get it in there. And then, uh, and then we'll work on the other stuff later. But my one question I have is what about, what would you say in terms of protein for the menopausal and perimenopausal woman, uh, plant protein, animal protein, does it matter? Can they sh- animal, do both? Animal protein and Animal First protein. Foremost. Yes. I'm sorry, vegans, but <laughs> especially in menopause, we need animal protein. We need it to be a complete protein and we need to be lifting weights, of course. And if you're lifting weights, you need to increase that protein even more. And I do like, I do have some vegans in my group and I still preach it to them that, Hey, if you're going to be vegan, then you have to be even more on top of this and make sure that you're getting in your protein as best as possible. My next question, uh, going back to the metabolic um, syndrome, you said that assuming you don't have metabolic s- syndrome, which is basically you don't, right? You're, you're having, you're struggling with your weight and a lot of other diseases and other problems. You should, you know, you would recommend doing a paleo diet. But as I understand, at least in North America, that most people are meta- have metabolic syndrome most people are not following everything that we need to do to not be metabolically flexible and metabolically healthy. Exactly. Yeah. So do those people also can do the paleo diet? You would recommend them to do that? Or is there something else for those people? That are really metabolically sick? Yeah. Uh, for people like that, that have a hard time, typically there's a lot of food addiction happening. And sometimes it's just, you got to start really simple, right? Because they've tried, typically they've tried all the diets under the sun, right? They've tried going vegan. They've tried doing calorie, they've tried everything. And they keep resorting back to that standard American diet because it's what's most palatable and they've got addiction to that food. So in somebody like that, a, you've got to start looking outside the box and start going, it's it's not the diet, it's up here in the head, it's emotional stuff, right? That maybe you need to go and see a therapist, go try something different that deals with the emotional part of your eating habits. And that's what I talk a lot about on my podcast, The Other Side of Weight Loss, is could it be emotional? Could it be gut dysbiosis? Could it be that you've got heavy metals, mold toxicity? All of these things actually drive insulin resistance, but also just weight gain in general and hormone dysfunction. Um, could it be that you just have a major hormonal imbalance that, you know, somebody could, you know, let's say take some thyroid and voila, their food cravings go down, they lose weight. So there's so much to it. Like it, it just goes on and on and on. So no paleo is not like the end all be all for diets. And this is going to work for everybody. A hundred percent not, <laughs> it's not that easy, but for the person that can eat well and doesn't have a lot of food addiction, I definitely steer towards an ancestral diet to seeing that that 
works really well for people. They don't typically have to calorie count. They can just, they, they get very satiated. They can go a longer time in between meals. Their blood sugar stabilizes just from eating those whole foods without the grains, without the beans, you know, healthy fats, healthy animal protein. So the other subset of people, you, you have some work to do. You have to start looking outside the box because if nothing's worked for you up until this point, then you got to start digging deeper and figuring out the root cause of the weight gain. Makes perfect sense. Tell us, just wrap up and give us your three top tips for, it could be nutrition, it could be anything for a woman going through peri or peri peri perimenopause or postmenopause, how do you recommend that she control her weight? Your three top tips for controlling weight or getting metabolically healthy for a woman in peri or postmenopause. Lift heavy things. It's a weight lift. Obviously eat very well, right? You're going to, you still have to eat well prior and prioritize your protein. So if you can, you know, if it suits your body type, paleo, if not, you can go a little lower carb or higher carb, whatever, but some version of that, like I said, but prioritize the protein. And then thirdly, you have got to replace the hormones. And th that's for majority of women. There is a small subset of women that can't replace their hormones. It's not a good fit for them. But for, in most cases, we have had our hormones our whole life and they've been of benefit to us. So most people can handle health-wise hormone replacement therapy. We know it's safe. It's body identical. And all of the research points towards the fact that this can really help with all diseases of aging. Um, the, no, well, stop there. We'll stop there. Okay, I get, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. I got so many other questions. That we I can keep going. I can... <laughs> so those are my okay. three. <laughs> we, we, yeah, we covered a lot, a lot of questions anyways that I had to ask you, but I wanted to... Uh, go to your own personal story because every time we kind of chat you uh you have something new and the la latest thing that you've done for body composition and feeling good and insulin resistance and all that has been your experience with trisepatide which is uh similar to ozempic as a weight loss peptide tell us a little bit about that story how it affected you uh and do, would you recommend it for somebody Mm -hmm. A minute, a peri so, of postmenopausal woman. We're talking to this audience here. <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. And this is this is my demographic of women that I work with. And like I said before, there's some women that they do all of these things that we just discussed, and they lose the weight and they feel great and they go on their merry way. But there's a large set of women that don't. That they do everything right and they can continue to gain weight, or they can't lose the weight that they gained, and. I was that person. So I, I did, you know, like I, I gained a bunch of weight. I did, I went, I, I decided, okay, I'm going to just get strong and get healthy and replace the hormones. And I did all those things. And then my, well, my weight did come down. And so that was great, but then it just held steady. It was like, we're not going past this point. And I was willing to accept the way it was. And then our mutual friend, <laughs> Nat Nidham, came on my podcast to discuss peptides. And I had tried some maglutide, Ozempic, and had a very terrible experience. I felt really sick. It gave me horrible migraines. Didn't lose weight in that month that I was on it. So I was like, I kind of had forgotten about it. I was like, no, I can't do that. And this was when now trisepatide had come out and was all the rage. And I decided, well, I'm going to give this a try because according to Nat, it had a far less side effects. So I was like, okay, I'm going to try it. So I got it and I've had, I've been on it now for three months. I went from 138 pounds. My, my normal set point weight was 128 pounds. I was 128 pounds from the time that I started going paleo for like 15 years. And it just, it didn't move, not 15 years, probably 12 years. And then menopause hit, everything 
went to hell in a hand basket and I rapidly put on weight and I went up to 145 pounds, which is the heaviest I'd ever been besides being pregnant. So I'd gotten down to 138 and so I dropped down to even 133 at one point and then I went back to 138. So it was just kind of hanging around there and it didn't seem to matter what I did. It was just going to stay there. So I was going to accept that. And I'd put on a lot of muscle. So I was like, yeah, no, this is okay. So be, I go on Terzepatide and I just actually- Just to let people know, to let me, just to let people know when you go on Terzepatide, what does that mean? Give them a little visual. So it's a, a once a week injection of a peptide. And, and you inject yourself, right? Yes. Yep. Yep. And so I do have a, a program where we, for women that are interested in using peptide therapy for weight loss. So I get mine and my members get it through a peptide website that is a private website. So it's not, you can't, you cannot access it through your, like on your own, which you can at other, there is some, like, I think, uh, peptide sciences sells it. I think there's, they're the only one that sells it openly, which I'm surprised that they do. Cause I think they could get in trouble for that. Um, anyways, so through a private peptide, very trusted peptide site, um, I order peptides for myself and my members order for themselves as well. And then I teach them how to use it properly and how to change their diet and their eating habits and use this time on this peptide to really work on themselves, work on their fitness, work on their eating behavior, because the peptide, it, it works on multiple mechanisms in the system. But one of them is that it really quiets that the, the food noise down in the brain. So you don't care to eat to be honest, like it's just, it suddenly just doesn't become a thing anymore. You're just like, yeah, I guess it's time to eat something. You don't crave sugar. You don't like, it's not satisfactory to eat sugar anymore. So you're just kind of like, meh. They even have seen that it's helped with like alcoholism, drug addicts, any sort of addictive behavior. It really helps that because you don't get the payoff anymore because it's actually affecting the dopamine centers of the brain. Wow. So I not, I didn't have a lot of food noise, but it was there. Like I said, like every, you know, three o'clock in the afternoon, I was just like, Oh, I need something carby, you know, <laughs> I have to go eat, you know, drink a smoothie or, you know, have a little piece of chocolate or whatever it is. And that, and it, I have, I have my, my little drawer here and it's got some like toffee in it. That was, I have like a toffee at three o'clock in the afternoon. <laughs> I haven't touched it for three months. It has, I have no interest Dang. in it. Wow. So anyways, I went down, I got down to 120 pounds, which is the thinnest I've been since uh, probably early twenties. So it went, I, you go past your set point. And so people understand Karen here has horrible weight loss resistance. Like I have had the worst time. I, I was the person that could eat 500 calories a day and not lose a single pound ever. Oh. It was terrible terrible. And this is like how, why I got into this business was when I was in my early thirties, I was rapidly gaining weight for no explicit, like for no reason at all. I was started working out. I started eating perfectly and I just kept gaining weight. It's a long story, so I won't get, get into it. But since then, like I've even before that, I was never that really thin person. I always struggled, you know, to keep the weight off. I was bulimic in high school. So I've had a lifetime of thinking about my weight, constantly trying to get down a few pounds. I finally was like, okay, 128 pounds is clearly my set point. I'm going to accept that. And I never had to count calories. I never had to do anything. And I just stayed there for 10, like I said, over 10 years, I stayed there on a paleo-based diet. Great. So this terzepatide, I lost weight every single week without trying and if I had done it without, if I had just cut the calories, which I've done many times and not lost a single pound, I lost weight every single week on this shock. It was, Why? to me, it was mind blowing because they, they don't even know the half of it, I don't think. <laughs> so it's 94% something that you already produce in your gut. It's a peptide that we produce. So this is giving your body more of that peptide. And so it acts on several different mechanisms. It works on the glucagon. Uh, it works on insulin. 
It works on blood sugar sensitivity, works on the dopamine centers of the brain. There's rumor that it changes the hypothalamus. Um, there's, it helps to reverse all the metabolic diseases they're seeing, like even helps with the plaque buildup in the brain for to prevent Alzheimer's, liver, fatty liver disease, it can help reverse. Like it just, it's crazy. And then also it slows the transit time of food down in the stomach. So you stay full for longer, but they found, so a lot of people think that that's why that they lose weight. But in the research, it actually shows that after a couple of months of being on it, that actually starts to go back to normal. So a lot of people find like their appetite, and I definitely found that with myself, like my appetite started to kind of go back to normal in about month two. And I was like, oh, I'm eating more and I'm still losing weight. So it helps you to become more sensitive to the blood sugar more insulin sensitive, plus is doing this stuff to the brain and the glucagon. And so there's several mechanisms that it's working on. So it's not just about slow, slowing the transit time of food down and reducing your hunger because some people don't even get those side effects and they still lose weight. So it's, 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 it is by far the best weight loss drug we've ever seen. There is a lot of shaming Ozempic shaming, Manjaro shaming going on on the internet. So you will see a whole slew of horrible, horrible things of people talking about it. And that this is terrible for you. And then you have to stay on it for life, which there is truth to that. Because my body weight normally is not at 120 pounds, which is not too skinny. I don't look too skinny, right? No, Sarah? you're perfect. Perfect. No, you're perfect. Perfect. I don't, and I, and I was good before too, but this is like, oh, this is great. I just, like, I just had, I, you saw my Instagram. I just posted a picture of me in a freaking bikini. I've never done that before ever. I was not since I was in my twenties living in Mexico. So to be 47 years old and to show the world me in a bikini was like, oh my God. So my body, that's not my normal body weight. So if I went off of this terzepatite right now, I would gain all the weight back. Guaranteed. And in the research, it shows that anybody that stops taking it, the like 90% of people will regain the weight. Ah, uh, so you so, got to be on it for a while. I mean, but do you cycle it on and off or maybe yes. change the dosage and sort of tweak it? Okay. Yes. So there's two different things that can happen. So a lot of people... I've interviewed like experts on this where they've used it a lot. And what they've seen is that some women that were eating well and they were healthy, like myself, let's say they were doing all the right things prior. They go on the terzepatide, they lose the weight. Then they want to come off of it. They'll typically gain about five pounds back. And then it will typically stop there as long as they're still eating well and exercising and doing all the right things, replacing the hormones, et cetera, et cetera. So there is some people that have come off of it successfully and have not regained all the weight. That's great. But majority of people, especially if you go past your set point, A, you have to start, you have to set in your new set point. And that can take about a year. So I have to remain at 120 pounds for a year in order to set that new set point. And then we'll see like, can I come off of it then completely? And will it remain there? I don't know. We don't have enough evidence of, of that because most people stay on it. And up until now, it's been mostly used in diabetics. It's been around for a very long time, eight, um, 12 years for Ozempic and eight years for Trisepatide. It's been researched and, and studied on millions of people. It's so, approved by the FDA, is that? Or it's is approved this... by the FDA. Okay. Uh, Not that that means anything sometimes. For obesity. I... What? Um, obesity, it's approved now for obesity, Ozempic, not Manjaro yet. Okay. But it's, it, it's going to be. The FDA approval thing, I don't know. It, it, they've approved Oreo cookies and Pringles it, too. <laughs> right? So I yes. sometimes go, well, I don't know <laughs> if it's FDA approved. I don't know how much that means, but okay, whatever. Yeah, um, but you know, it's the pharmaceutical company saw that it's going to be this billion dollar investment, right? So of course they're going to take hold of it and run with it. And pharmaceutical company, we can't trust them. And this is a lot of what the naysayers are like, oh yeah, we can't trust in the pharmaceutical companies. This is all going to backfire. It's going to be terrible for people. But yet look at the peptide world right now. 
and all the people that are on the peptide, the other peptides, right? Growth hormone peptide and uh, BPC-157. And it's all okay to take those peptides because the pharmaceutical company hasn't got a hold of them yet. But it's not okay to take these peptides, which are the exact same, the pharmaceutical from a peptide coming exactly the same molecules. So that doesn't make any sense to me. It's like, well, mm. so it's okay for us to take all these other peptides, but it's not okay to take this one because it's for because it makes weight loss easy. And making that should weight be loss shamed. Easy, <laughs> right. <laughs> it's like when people are and then people are like, oh, you just need to work out harder. It's all about willpower. You just eat right, go carnivore, do this, do that. And it's like, but what about all of the women? that have struggled to lose weight their whole life, who have had food noise their whole life, who've had food addiction, who are in menopause and doing everything right and still can't lose that weight. It's devastating for women, devastating. When they have this huge gut coming off of their pants and they're like, really? This, I can't accept this. And they can go on this peptide and lose all of that weight that they've tried so hard to lose for the last 10 years of their life, 20 years, 30 years. Why is that not okay? Yeah, it's, you know, it just it's really it, it sad. Makes yeah. me mad. I think, well, the, uh, the, we do have uh, 12 years of evidence or eight years. Um, maybe some people are saying, well, what's going to happen in 20 or 30? Will there be a long term? effect. I mean, uh, uh, you know, we're going to pay be. for this later on. Yes. But what are the long-term effects of being obese? And typically what we see is that women can go, once they've lost the weight that they want to lose, they can take a shot every four to six weeks to maintain their weight loss. So taking a shot every four to six weeks, which has a ton of metabolic benefits to it, not just weight loss, I mean, metabolic disease drives every major killer of women too, right? Alzheimer's, you know, is like the diabetes, the whatever type three diabetes. We know cancer is driven by sugar. We know fatty liver disease is driven by sugar. Like the list goes on. So here we are helping to taking something that's ninety four percent identical to what we're already producing. It helps with to reverse all these metabolic diseases you have to take a shot every four to six weeks. And I think to myself, what would I do for the rest of my life to try to lose weight? How much pressure do I have in my head go on myself to, to, to lose weight and have a, have a good physique, right? Especially in the industry that I'm in. And I think to take a shot every four to six weeks to not have that noise in my head anymore is amazing. And I'll tell you, we have, I have pro we have over a hundred women in the group in the one peptide group. And then with my private clients and my other hormone group, there's quite a few, there's maybe another 50 or so. And the things that women say, it, it, it literally brings tears to my eyes sometimes because they'll say like, oh my gosh, not to have the food noise anymore is the most amazing feeling in the whole world. It's the first time in my life that I'm not being driven by those thoughts. 24 seven. She's the one woman's like, I don't think about garlic bread anymore. This is amazing. <laughs> then, you know, they're put going in there. They're, I'm, I'm putting on pants that I haven't fit into in 10 years. I feel so good. I feel, you know, and, and we, we really emphasize, you still got to work out. You still have to eat well. You have to maintain that muscle tissue. You got to feed the system full of nutrients. Like we really are trying to do it right. And there are side effects. It's not for everybody. You do have to plan to possibly be on it for the rest of your life to maintain the weight loss. So these are all things to consider before you do it. Um, people can feel nauseous. People can get constipated. People can vomit. Um, there are side effects. And so it's not a perfect medication. Um, so you do have to, like I said, just think about, you got to, you got to educate yourself on it. Don't listen to social media. I did a great podcast where I actually dove into the science behind all of it. The pros, the cons of taking these drugs, the difference between semaglutide and trisepatide, my own story. And people have told me that was the best podcast they've heard on GLP ones. Send because me I the don't, link. I'm not, yeah. Okay. I will. Yes. Put I will. that in the <laughs> show two notes. Links. Okay. Yes. Two links. We want those. <laughs> So yes. one question about Ozempic versus Trisepatide. Uh, I remember that uh, Ozempic, if you had 
uh, pancreas issues or thyroid issues like thyroid cancer that you shouldn't, you're not a candidate for that. Is that the same for trisepatide? It is. Yes. Um, the cancer, the thyroid cancer, there's a black box warning on the medications that if you have a family history or a personal history of papilloma, pap papilloma thyroid cancer, I think that's how you say it. Um, then you shouldn't take it because it can cause that. And yeah, but if you already had the in, cancer and you removed it, like how can it cause a cancer again? Yeah, if you, if you have no thyroid, exactly. Yeah. But they'll still say that you shouldn't take it. But it's never that has never been replicated in humans to date. Nobody has ever developed that type of cancer from taking Ozempic or Manjaro. Um, it was seen in the rats, and apparently those rats, it's actually. Um, common for those type of rats to get that kind of thyroid cancer. I don't know if that's true. I haven't been able to find that to be validated, but I did hear a doctor say that. Um, and then they were given very high, high amounts, like doses that would never be given to humans. Mm. So it's never been replicated. They're actually trying to get it taken off that like not the label. Not black. Interesting. Yeah, yeah. And you have any pen any clients that you have that do have that had thyroid cancer, removed their thyroid or pancreas issues, go on it without a problem. I have. Yep. Yep. Mm. The thyroid, okay. not yeah, pancreas stuff. Um, I wouldn't recommend it for somebody that has a history of pancreatitis. Less than 1% in the studies got pancreatitis from taking it. So it very low levels, but it still happened. Um, gallbladder attacks can happen as well. Uh, because of the transit time of food being slowed down and your body can't tolerate high fat foods. Uh, so I have had a couple of people that have had that, myself included. I had a gallbladder attack after eating a really high fat meal and it was not fun. Um, that was when you were doing her. keto? <laughs> Maybe. No, it wasn't when I was doing keto. No. But no, 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 was, uh, the, I was eating Indian food. Oh, okay. And it was too, the, all the coconut milk and the ghee and everything. And it just killed my stomach. So I got a gallbladder attack from that after that. So I'm very careful now of eating high fat foods <laughs> while well, being on trisepatide anyways. Uh, so I'm, yeah, go ahead. No, that's it. That's good. So, so yeah, no, I, 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 I have more questions about the peptides, but I'm just going to go and listen to your podcast and I recommend everybody else to do that too. <laughs> and um, so, cause I do have to let you go because we are wrapping up, yeah. but one last question before I do is going back to the hormone therapy. Do you think all women should be on the same sort of routine with their hormone therapy, like uh, every day, or do you think we should be cycling in and out estrogen, progesterone, you know, getting sort of a personalized uh, thing from our doctors or practitioners like you? Um, yes, I, I've done a lot of research. I've studied under different modalities of hormone replacement therapy. I've done, you know, ones where it was like static dose, you use everything every day, um, you use progesterone and you use a bias every single day. And, and then I've also studied under people like Dr. Felice Gersh and other practitioners who are really trying to change a lot of this, which is for receptor health, we should be cycling our hormones um, to we can never mimic what we do in our fertile years. There's some hormone therapies that try to like the Wiley protocol and physiologic restoration where they're doing like, you know, higher doses and they're cycling it through the month and they're really trying to mimic our levels of a 25 year old. Some women thrive on that and they need that and it's great, but it just goes to show that every woman usually needs something a little bit different. Uh, static dosing, what we see is that it helps in the beginning. Uh, and then, but eventually they, the woman starts to say that she doesn't feel the effects of her hormone replacement therapy anymore. And if we use progesterone, for instance, every single day, which we don't, when we're fertile, we produce it after ovulation, which is halfway through our cycle. If we use progesterone every single day, it actually can start to downregulate estrogen. And estrogen is needed to upregulate 
regulate progesterone receptors. So if you're using high doses of progesterone every single day and you're using a low dose of biased every single day, eventually you're not going to be getting the effects of the estrogen, which then in turn is going to make you not get the effects of the progesterone. So for receptor health, there's certain things that we want to do to help us to get the most out of our hormone therapy. And the whole bias thing, which is 80% estriol, which is the pregnancy estrogen, and then 20% estradiol. We know that estradiol has to get to a certain level in menopausal women on HRT to protect us from Alzheimer's, osteoporosis, the cancer, dementia, all of these cardiovascular disease, we know that it's estradiol that needs to get to a certain level and typically biased is not going to get you there. And that estriol being a pregnancy hormone, why are we trying to mimic pregnancy in menopausal women? Never in our life do we have that much estriol over estradiol unless we're pregnant. So there is some chatter, not a lot of research, but some, some you talked to people like Dr. Felice Gersh, who's a, an amazing hormone we did a um, podcast yeah. with her. Did you get her yet? Yeah, I'm sure you had her. Oh, as well, I've had no? her twice. Yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. 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 So she talks about how there is a research that shows that it can um, suppress the innate immune system, estriol. And this is so that we don't reject the fetus in oh, pregnancy. And this is why we'll see things like MS go into reversal during pregnancy and other autoimmune conditions are going to reversal during pregnancy because of the high doses of estriol and it suppressing the innate immune system. So her belief is why would we be doing this? And I completely agree. It's like our whole entire lives, we have this estradiol being the most important of all of our estrogens that help ward off all of these major diseases, not estriol, but yet we're, go we're using boatloads of estriol in menopausal women. And there's even some research that shows that it could be diet, I never say this right, diabogenic, which means basically can, can promote diabetes if you're just working on the better receptors, the estrogen, est estrogen better receptors, which is all estriol axon is the better receptors. Estradiol, remember, does 50. You mentioned biased, B-I-E-S-T. What, what is that? You said so it three 80 times. 80% estriol and 20% estradiol, typically. And, Sometimes oh, they can be 50-50 amounts, but so it's that, mostly estriol. So that's a brand that you get in North America? Is that something, because I'm, I'm not so sure. So this what... is in, this is all over the world from compounding pharmacies, not from oh. pharmaceutical. It's it's always compounded. Okay. And what did you, so in Europe, they do that too? Biased? If I went to my doctor and said, make me biased, uh, would she understand? Yes, trying to remember. I think so in certain places they would do it. Mm -hmm. um, is Europe it, is funny. Europe it's, is it's not yeah. quite as the same as North America <laughs> yeah. when it comes to hormone replacement therapy. But is Typically, I'll see it pharmaceutical. So biased is, is, you say it's compounded, but that's just a code word for something or is that actual brand of compounding or it's just no, so if it's compounded, it's going to come from a compounding pharmacy. So a pharmacist is going to make it at his pharmacy. So okay. he can decide that way you can you can make different adjustments to whatever medication it is that they're made, that they're compounding. So a doctor will write a prescription for bias 80, 20, which is yeah. estriol 80%, estradiol 20%, and then they'll give the, how much they want. Oh, so bias is just another word to say common. compound, just we want compounded and it can be, it, the doctor can change it to anything. Yeah. yeah. You can get just, just compounded estradiol cream. Okay. Okay. It's just a hundred percent estradiol. You can get trias, which is estrone, estradiol, and estriol. Oh, I see. I see. Bias yes. and trias. Rather that makes, than understand. if you were to get it through a pharmacy, that's a pharmaceutical grade brand, pharmaceutical brand hormone, it's still bioidentical, but then you're going to only be able to get estradiol. So you can get an estradiol patch, different levels and estradiol gel. They don't do a cream. Um, it's in Europe, we there's do sprays. Progesterone. There's and a yes, spray you yes. can put on your arm. And so 
Is it estradiol or is it bias? Estradiol. It's just estradiol. estradiol. It's what you get in the pharmacy. Good. It's not compound. I mean, it's, we just right. would say compounded. We wouldn't say the word bias, but I guess that's just depends what language you're speaking. Yeah. Right, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's probably yeah, I never so, came across it. So to answer your question, I do think everybody is individual and you have to really look at what's going on and estriol can be breast protective. So if you have a history of breast cancer, you may want to just do estriol. And if you haven't gotten much from your static dose of HRT for the last couple of years, then you may want to change things up and try maybe cycling your hormones. And, you know, we do things like on day 12 of the month, um, you triple your estrogen dose, your estradiol. And this can help. This is what naturally happens when we're fertile. And this upregulates a tumor suppressing gene. So your body is so smart. We do so, so many good. things that are amazing. And in that, and it also by increasing it on that one day, that helps to upregulate your progesterone receptors. Amazing. So, progesterone so people can they really need to see a hormone specialist or a menopause specialist for this. And, and you're one of them and to get everything interpreted, you know, the testing to understand, because I know that just traditional doctors very often, not all, you know, there's some good ones there that they don't speak this language. So where can we find you um, on your, your website, Facebook, Instagram, you're, you're kind of everywhere. Uh, you are giving away the the hormone quiz to find out which hormones really could be stopping you from losing weight. Yeah. So they should start there. Where else should we direct the audience to find you? Uh, so Karen Martell Hormones on Instagram and Facebook. Um, the podcast is about to go through a name change. So maybe by the time this comes out, it may be something other than the other side of weight loss. <laughs> so there's a rebrand happening. So it's got to be something about hormones because it's definitely morphed into that over the last, oh my gosh, now five plus years that we I've had the podcast over 270 episodes, over 1 million downloads, top 100 on iTunes. Um, so there is so much information on there for women for about, and that's probably the best resource that you can go to for hormones for women on my site. So, You'll have to give me the link yeah. to the new one. I'll just put the link yeah. to the other side of weight loss and then yes. we'll update it when, when you get there. So I will have links into the show notes, how to find you, where to get you, how to sign up to your programs. You said you mentioned you have a weight loss program and a hormone program. What's the difference? Yes. Yeah. So we have just a, just for the peptides, for the weight loss peptide group. Um, and then my other group has weight loss peptides in it as well. All the information from the other group, but it is primarily about hormones and perimenopause and that transformative journey into menopause and beyond. So I help women with that, with their hormones, doing lab reads. It's just an, it's a, it's a great place to go. If you can't afford to see somebody privately at a hormone clinic or, you know, it does get expensive, even I'm expensive to see privately. So it's, it's affordable. And so it's been going for five years. We've had like 5,000 women go through it. It's been great. So that's, there's a whole bunch of information in there and a great community. Why am I not in that community? Like, sign me up. You can just be in the community, Zora, anytime. <laughs> Got to be a part of this. Cool. So we'll find all of that on your website. How much is it to yeah. be a part of the community? Um, I will give you a coupon code. So to get 50% off, it's usually $99 a month. And then you can do, I'll give you a, you and your, well, you just get to be for free, but your listeners can have 50% off coupon. Oh, so what right. should we make it? Zor, Zor, let's make it Zora 50. Yes. Oh my God. You're so generous. Thank you so much. I am so happy. And I, I, I will see you guys listening. I want to see you there. I want you to use that code and I want to chat with you in her group and Karen Martell's group. So join us there before I let you go. Do you have any last words for a woman in menopause? I do. Let's this be transformative let this be in a positive way transformative don't let these years go on and on suffering like i can't believe how many women just suffer and this can go on for 10 15 years during this time period 
and beyond. I have women that are in their 60s that are still getting hot flashes. Know that you don't have to put up with any of this. You do not have to suffer. You can. These can be the best years of your life where you feel your best and you can look your best too. So don't settle for less. Great. I love it. Thank you so much, Karen. I'm so happy we're connected. Thank you, Natalie Nidham, for that. Yes. <laughs> And I will have to have you on again because I do have a million one other questions. So let's make sure we get you back. So have a yes. wonderful day. And everyone else who's listening, have a good day, good night, good morning, wherever you are. <laughs>